Welcome to our beginning Under the Bomb talk story series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola uh, from the Monson Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Our talk story today will focus on Spark Matsunaga, a warrior poet with storyteller Alton Takayama Chung. Thank you so much for coming back with us, Alton, today. Uh, thank you for joining us today, though, to learn about resiliency during unprecedented times. Uh, today's event will be live streamed on our community Facebook pages through the 100 Infantry Battalion Veterans Education Center, aka Club 100, Facebook page, uh, Alton Takayama Chung's Facebook page, and the Spark and Matsuna Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution Facebook page. Thank you for joining us today. Our storyteller today is a local boy, uh, Alton Takayama Chung, who grew up with the stories, superstitions, and the magic of the Hawaiian Islands. He tells stories of the plantation days, the Japanese Americans' experience of World War II, Asian folk tales, Hawaiian legends, and of course, ghost stories. He has performed in storytelling festivals across the United States and internationally, and is also former chairman of the board of directors of the National Storytelling Network, the national organization of US storytellers. Today, Alton will share the story of the late Senator Spark and Matsunaga, or as he called, he was called endearingly, Sparky. Today, uh, October 8th, is his birthday, and he would have been 103 years old. It is Sparky whom we are honored to be named after here at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace, as well as continue the legacy and vision for peace. Growing up in poverty of, of the plantation camps of Kauai, Spark Matsunaga was a warrior, a member of the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a poet establishing the position of Poet Laureate of the United States, and a politician. Serving in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, he created the United States Insti Peace, Institute for Peace um, and spearheaded the redress bill for Japanese Americans incarcerated during World War II through the U.S. Senate. Having tasted the bitterness of war, this man of compassion always strove to find sweet and everlasting peace. And to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to our storyteller, Alton Takayama Chung. Thank you, Alton. Well, thank you so very much. And thank you for inviting me to be here on, you know, to celebrate Spark Matsunaga's birthday. Uh, before we really begin, I want to go and thank the uh, people at the Storybook Theater on the island of Kauai and Mark Jeffers, executive director. It was through him that uh, they really uh, commissioned this work. And it's through all their support, all their help, we're able to actually go and bring this, this story to life. And uh, this story is actually premiered at the Storybook Theater in Hanapepe, Kauai, uh, about two years ago. And so, uh, so today we're gonna to be talking about Spark Matsunaga, uh, former House Representative in the US Senator from Hawaii. Uh, but before we really get into that story, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. And to do that, you need to understand why Hawaii is the way it is and how it got there. And to do that, I'm gonna go and be giving you my quick and dirty, mostly irreverent uh, version of Hawaii 101, my apocryphal version of Hawaiian history. So let's begin. Prologue. Hawaii is one of the most remote places in the world. It's like 2,400 miles to the nearest continent. And uh, it's, Hawaii is actually a collection of like 4,000 or so uh, islands and atolls all extending of like 1,500 miles to the northwest toward Midway Island. There are like eight major islands in the chain, uh, the northernmost of which is Kauai, and to the southwest of Kauai is the island of Mi'ihau, privately held island, and to the southeast is the island of Oahu, uh, where Honolulu is, where most of the population of Hawaii lives. The largest island in the entire archipelago is the island of Hawaii, or the Big Island as we call it, and Hawaii became a state in 1959. Part one, the ancient Hawaiians or the good old days. Now it's believed that the islands were first settled by voyagers from the Marquesas in French Polynesia about 400 or 500 CE, current era. And about 500 years later, bam, new folks from Tahiti show up about 1000 CE. And for some reason, all contact is lost with the rest of Polynesia. And for 800 years, the Hawaiian Islands are isolated. I mean, back then, hey, life was good. Well, except for the skirmishes between the chiefs of different islands and the occasional famine. But for the most part, you know, everything was pretty much okay. Now, prior to discovery 
um, it's estimated there were about maybe 500,000 Hawaiians living throughout the main islands of Hawaii. Okay? They had like their own really complex and rich society and their own pantheon of Hawaiian gods and goddesses. There were four major gods, one of which was Lono. The legend has it that uh, he appeared one day and taught the people a few things, and then he left saying, I'll be back. Now, the Hawaiians kind of lived in harmony with the land, the Aina, uh, which is only, only taking what they really needed, which was kind of a good thing because you're on an island and what you got is what you got. Okay, part two, the arrival of Captain Cook or the return of Lono. Now, British explorer Captain James Cook first made landfall in the islands on, on the island of Kauai, about 1778. He traded with the natives for provisions. I mean, it was a good deal. He got fresh food, he got fresh water, and he gave the Hawaiians iron tools and syphilis. Now, after wandering around Alaska, you know, for the summer, looking for the Northwest Passage, Captain Cook returned, this time arriving on the Big Island of Hawaii, which where due to some happy coincidences, he was mistaken for the returning god, Lono. Well, things went bad, and Captain Cook got whacked in the head a few times. I mean, suffice to say, Captain Cook came, he saw, he got whacked. Okay. Cook's expedition returns to England, and now, bam, Hawaii's on the map. It is now open season for any trader, whaler, or warship to stop and reprovision in the middle of the Pacific. Meanwhile, one chief rose to power. His name was Kamehameha. He ended up whacking all the other big chiefs or, or getting them to submit to him, and he united all of the islands and became the first king of Hawaii. King Kamehameha the Great, or the founder of the Hawaiian monarchy. Kamehameha dies in 1819. Bummer. At the time of his death, it's been estimated there were about maybe Hawaiian population had dwindled down to 150,000. That means in the span of Kamehameha's lifetime, the Hawaiian population had dropped by 70%. Part three, the arrival of the missionaries, or there goes the neighborhood. Now, the Protestant missionaries from New England arrived about 1820. Oh boy. They were shocked, absolutely shocked by the behavior of these scantily clad heathens, and they condemned the hula as a heathen dance. Unfortunately, for a culture that had no written language, hula dance was one way that they passed on their cultural wisdom. Bam, bye-bye dance, bye-bye culture. Now, to pass on the word of God, the missionaries created a written language for the Hawaiians. Now, this was a great deal. The ruling class understood the power of the written language, and so they signed up for this new religion so they could learn how to read and write their own language. By the time of the overthrow, about 70 years later, which, by the way, the Americans helped orchestrate, over 90% of the Hawaiians were literate. That is better than the United States today. So the missionaries, they got converts. The Hawaiians, they got a written language. And there was an influx of traders, whalers, explorers, adventurers, and through them, the Hawaiian Islands, they got all kinds of great gifts. These included measles, influenza, and smallpox. Later, when the Chinese arrived, they brought their own gift to the mix, leprosy. These were diseases that the Hawaiians had never seen before. These were very exciting times. Now, unlike fairy tales, the Hawaiian monarchs after Kamehameha the Great, the first, they didn't live very long or very happy lives. When Kamehameha the First died, the royal rulership football was passed to his son, Liho Liho, who became Kamehameha II. Now, nevertheless, I mean, Kamehameha's the first most favorite wife. She was the one who was really running everything, and she didn't want to give up power. But she did see the writing on the wall. 
And under her influence, Kamehameha II, he broke with the traditional ways. Six months into his reign, bam! The wine priests, the kunas, they were disband, disbanded. And all the ancient temples and idols were destroyed. Out with the old gods, in with the new. Now, Kamehameha II and his queen, they died of measles in England while waiting for an audience with King George IV. They had forgotten to call ahead and couldn't get on his calendar. Bummer. He was 27 years old. Well, the royal rulership put Paul Zen lateral to his brother, who becomes Kamehameha III. He takes that ball. He goes running down the field. He's past the 10, past the 20. Oh, and he's tackled just before the 30-year line. For over 29 years, he rules Hawaii, and he's the longest reigning monarch of the Hawaiian monarchy. Oh, but wait a minute. There's a flag on the play. Oh, it's called roughing the ruler. Okay, penalty. Kamehameha III has to go and sign a couple constitutions on the advice of some ex-missionaries from America. The king has to give up some of his power. Bummer. But also at this time, the first sugarcane plantation begins operation on the island of Kauai in 1835. Within 30 years, sugar will become to dominate the Hawaiian economy. Now, those pesky Americans, they kept pushing the monarchy to become more democratic and to allow people, including foreigners, to own land. Well, Kamehameha III finally caves. In, something, in 1848, there's something called the Great Mahele, where instead of the king owning everything, now, people can own little plots of land. Unfortunately, the Hawaiian people, like the Native Americans in North America, they had no real concept of land ownership. Americans and Europeans began buying up all the available land. And within 30 years, Westerners own 80% of the available private land. Kamehameha III, he dies at age 40. Bummer. The royal football is then passed to his nephew, who becomes Kamehameha IV. He dies at age 29. Bummer. The ball is then lateral to his brother, who becomes Kamehameha V. He dies nine years later, at age 40, without naming an heir. Oopsie. Fumble on the play. No more Kamehamehas. Don Pao finished. Bummer drag. Well, the royal rulership football is then punted to Kamehameha V's cousin, William Lonalino. He lasts a little over a year, and then he dies. Bummer. Paul is then punted again to David Kalakaua in 1874. By this time, whaling is kind of rapidly declining, and sugar is on the rise. Now, the descendants of the American missionaries who got here in 1820, they have gone into business. They are into banking, into shipping, and soon they take over the sugar industry. The most powerful of these companies are known as the Big Five. They are C. Brewer, Castle and Cook, Alexander and Baldwin, Theo H. Davies, and American Factors, otherwise known as Amfac. Now these oligarchs, because that's truly what they are, were behind the notion of allowing people to own land, and now they cash in big time. And due to their deep roots in the community, they become trusted advisors to the monarchy. Can you say foxes in the hen house? Part four, waves of immigration or here come the Asians. Now, both sugar and pineapple are labor intensive crops, physically demanding work in a hot, humid climate. Well, they tried to get the Hawaiians to go and do it and they went, <clears throat> You stupid or what? We're not going to do that. So the Chinese are brought in on five-year labor contracts. Turns out, Chinese really didn't want to do this either. So a lot of them, as soon as their contracts are up, they take all their money, they go back to China, but some of them stayed and opened up businesses. Thousands of Chinese had immigrated to Hawaii, and by the time of the American Civil War, well, Chinese outnumber the Haoles, or the Caucasians. This makes some of the Westerners very nervous. And 
the contract labor system was really closely resembled slavery, which was kind of a hot issue at this time back in the United States. In fact, they even fought a whole war about it. So 1882, America passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, which basically stops the immigration of Chinese laborers into the US. Americans thought this was such a great idea, they began leaning on the monarchy and saying, hey, you should do this too. Well, after a few years, the monarchy, the kingdom, caves in and Chinese are banned. Oh, so much for the Chinese immigrating to Hawaii. But plantations still need laborers to work for almost nothing and live in very harsh climates. Well, enter the Japanese. Now, the first Japanese contract laborers come to Hawaii in 1868. Now, by the 1880s, thousands of Japanese, mostly men, came to work in the fields. Many stayed and sent back to Japan for mail order picture brides. My grandmothers on both sides of my family were picture brides. Now, as the Japanese began to fulfill their contracts, some of them moved out of the plantations. They, other groups were brought in to, to go and fill the labor pool that they needed to pour the sugar cane in the pineapple fields. So people from Okinawa, Korea, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, they were all brought in. They were held, they were put in individual ethically divided caps. And the owners, they, they encouraged fights among these, these, these workers from these different camps. This was a way to keep the workers from uniting and gaining true power. The owners also, they also went to Europe to go and try and find workers. Most of the work Europeans said, well, I'll tell you what, increase the wages, improve the living conditions, eh, maybe we'll work for you. Well, this wasn't going to work for the sugar barons. I mean, <laughs> the only Europeans who ever really came over in large numbers were the Portuguese. And since they were closer to the ethnic background of the owners than the Asians, they were turned into, they became overseers or first line supervisors or lunas. Now, and they were also paid more than the Asians, even though they were doing the same type of work. Now, everyone spoke different languages. And to communicate this, a Creole language of Pidgin English was developed. Now, Pidgin was my first language. See, after this is after many, many years of living on the mainland, US. Pidgin is actually Hawaiian with different words added in. It is a living language. It changes. The pigeon I heard when growing up stay different than the pigeons I, that people are talking about now. Translation, the pigeon that I heard growing up is different than the pigeon that is spoken today. Part five, the overthrow or how America steals a nation. Howley, or Caucasian sugar owners, wanted more control over the government. Kalakaua, he pushed back. The businessmen then forced Kalakaua to sign a new constitution called the Bayonet Constitution, which favored the wealthy white elite. They gave the king a choice. Either sign this new constitution, or we're going to kill you. Well, Kalakaua signed. A broken man, Kalakaua dies in 1891, bummer. And the Royal Worldship Football is finally handed off to his sister, Lili Okalani, who becomes Hawaii's last queen. Now, the sugar barons, they wanted to control the monarchy. I mean, who do these Hawaiians think they were, you know? You think they were rulers of their own country or something like that. But queen Lili Okalani, she wanted to get rid of that bayonet constitution. Well, <laughs> this made the Americans the islands a little threatened, and a bunch of them got together, led by Lauren Thurston, who formed the Committee of Safety, and they decided to take over. He met secretly with the U.S. Minister John L. Stevens, who dispatched four boatloads of U.S. Marines from the USS Boston, anchored in Honolulu Harbor. These Marines, they surrounded Iolani Palace, and Thurston and his crew, they took over a municipal building, and they declared a provisional government, which, surprise, was immediately recognized by the U.S. Minister John L. Stevens. Well, not wanting her people to get hurt, Lily Okalani, she abdicated and surrendered, not to the Committee of Safety, but to the U.S. government. Well, 
The total population of the Native Hawaiians at this time was about 40,000. In little over 100 years, the population of Native Hawaiians had dropped from less than, to less than one-tenth of what it was before Captain Cook arrived. Now, triumphant, the provisional government, they asked the U.S. to annex Hawaii. What Grover Cleveland, who was president at the time, said, no, 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 bad doggy, bad doggy. You give Hawaii back to the queen. Well, hmm. that's not what the sugar barons wanted to hear. So they ignored Cleveland, and they created the Republic of Hawaii. They bided their time until Cleveland was out of office and McKinley was in. Now, the U.S. was engaged in the Spanish-American War. They had just defeated the Spanish fleet in the Philippines, and Hawaii would be a perfect refueling spot and a strategic base in the middle of the Pacific on their way to their new possession. Well, the vast majority of Native Hawaiians, they signed petitions protesting annexation. But nevertheless, Hawaii became a territory of the United States in 1898 and thus ended the Hawaiian kingdom. Bummer drag. Epilogue. In the early 1900s, sugar and pineapple were king in Hawaii, and the Big Five, for the most part, ran the territory of Hawaii. Those of us in Hawaii, we know this to be true, and this is something you'll probably never see in a U.S. history book. This was the Hawaii into which Spark Matsunaga was born. So that's the preamble, setting the stage to the beginning of Spark Matsunaga story. And again, we want to thank the uh, Storybook Theater and Mark Jeffers for commissioning this book. So now, the Spark Matsunaga warrior, the poet warrior. Good evening. Tonight, we'll be remembering and honoring a true son of Hawaii, Spark Matsunaga. In times when we seem to be a heartbeat away from nuclear war, it is important to remember and honor this warrior who dedicated himself to the pursuit of peace. Now we've asked his friend to come and say a few words about the late Senator. Please welcome Mr. Kenny Hiro Hiroshi. Uh, the folks asked me to go say a few words about my, uh, my friend, uh, Spock Matsunaga. You know, uh, if Spocky was here, he'd be laughing his head off, because, uh, you know, I don't like talking public, yeah? I mean, he was the outgoing guy. He was the guy who took the time to come over and uh, to visit with families, with kids, and, and tell them stories from Hawaii. He took the time to be kind to people. Whoever needed its help, <laughs> even an old capital cop like me. Um, he believed that inequality for everybody, that uh, men and women, they should be uh, judged for him or herself, not for the, the color of their skin or the shape of their eyes. No. He believed that his mission was to, to fight for the weak and to relieve suffering. He also believed that he could do anything he... he Believed in himself, he could do anything he put his mind to. And he got uh, people like me <laughs> to believe in ourselves too. Now, see, Spaki was born in Kukui Ula uh, on the island of Kauai about in 1916. Yeah? But his family moved to Hanapepe in the 1920s. And that's what I met him, you know, way back, small kid time. And uh, you know, growing up, our pockets always filled with marbles because you never knew when a game was going to start. I mean, we had the peeries and the agates and the cat's eyes and the bambuchas, the big marbles. <laughs> and, you know, we're constantly winning and losing marbles to each other. And when we weren't playing marbles, we are playing baseball. <laughs> Everybody had a, had a nickname. I mean, there was Mitpo Nozaki and Boxer Matsuda and Lefty Ozaki. And Masayuki, <laughs> that was Spocky's name back then. He was smarter than the rest of us all put together. He even skipped a couple grades. But 
because he was younger than the rest of us, he was a really slow runner. <laughs> I remember uh, one of the older kids was uh, watching Spucky run around the bases. And he yelled out, Hey, you stay slower than Spucky the old nag, yeah? Spocky or Spock Plug was the name of the slowpoke horse in the Bonnie Google Snuffy Smick comic strip. Well, after that, we just called him Spocky. Now, our parents worked for the sugar plantation for a dollar a day. That's right, a dollar a day. I mean, we were poor, but Spocky, he had a more worse. I mean, he told me one time, they never have anything to eat in the house. I mean, his mom would sometimes go and uh, skip meals just to make sure there was enough to go around. Now, Spocky's dad, he was a spiritual healer. And he was uh, really well-respected in the community. He often told Spocky, Understanding uh, the deeper meaning of life comes from hardship. <laughs> I kind of figure Spocky's understanding of life was pretty dang deep. <laughs> Success in life demands an early goal, which you must set and strive to gain. <laughs> that was one of Spocky's sayings, uh, Spocky's Spocks. He collected them and published them in a, in a uh, pocket calendar in 1985. When we were juniors in high school, Spocky asked our new uh, civics teacher, Mr. Clopton, is it the objective of American democracy to pay a Caucasian three times what is paid an Asian, even though they're working side by side and doing the same type of work? Mr. Clopton said, no, of course not. But the only way to change the system in Hawaii is to change the law. And to change the law, you got to become a legislature or a lawmaker. You got to become a politician, get into politics, run for office. Now, he figured that Hawaii will become a state pretty soon. So he tells Spocky, you should become a U.S. Senator. Oh, powerful words, huh? But Spocky, he took him to heart. Now, Spocky was the first person in his whole family to graduate from high school. He wanted to continue his education at the University of Hawaii. But tuition was $120 a year. Hey, no laugh. That's big money back then. He worked all kinds of odd jobs just trying to earn money. Then in 1937, he won $1,000 at a newspaper subscription contest for a newspaper on the island of Kauai. He gave his parents $600, and then he was on the next weekly packet to Honolulu to begin studying at the University of Hawaii. <laughs> now, Japan had just invaded China about this time, yeah? And so his freshman English class, Spocky wrote an essay entitled, Let Us Teach Our, Ch our People to Want Peace. If we want peace, we must educate people to want peace. We must replace attitudes favorable toward war with attitudes opposed to war. Teachers should let generals fall to the background and maybe bring leaders of social reform to the foreground. We must help our young people to understand that there are other types of bravery than that which is displayed on the battlefield. <laughs> Maybe a little idealistic, a little naive, but hey, that was Spocky. His pursuit of peace became uh, one of his lifelong goals. Now, in 1941, Spocky got his degree and he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserve, and he volunteered for service. Me? <laughs> I got drafted. <laughs> but that's how Spocky became the executive officer of a little company on the island of Molokai. Now, I think he enjoyed marching us around a little bit too much. Now, that first Sunday in December, we were about ready to go deer hunting. When we saw this plane flying above us, it got the, the red ball right in front of Japan on the wings. And Spocky goes, hey, these maneuvers look real realistic, yeah? And that's when the radio starts squawking, saying that we're under attack by the Japanese. Oh, we all go outside. We all look toward Pearl Harbor. We see the smoke rising up 60 miles away. 
that's when things got a little bit crazy. I remember being in the supply room in Spuckies, handing out rifles to people, telling us where we should take up positions on the beach to defend the airfield. We were so scared. We thought Japan was going to invade. And then when this Japanese submarine surfaced, oh, it's like shooting shells at the, at the fuel tanks at the airport. Oh, we, we let them have it. We drove the submarine away. In May 1942, all the Japanese American soldiers, they all rounded, we got all rounded up and we got shipped to Cap McCoy in Wisconsin. Oh, I mean, we were organized into the 100th Battalion Separate Order, as we called it, the one Puka Puka. Puka is pigeon for zero or whole, yeah? Well, we eventually got shipped to Italy to fight the Germans at a place called Hill 600. It was about mm, 80 miles southeast of Rome, near a place called Monte Cassino. Now, Spocky, he was now first lieutenant and executive officer of Company D. Now, going up the hill, one of Spocky's men tripped over a landmine, slightly wounding Spocky in the neck, but badly wounding his radio operator, Kazuo Kawano. While waiting for the medics to come up, Kazuo told Spocky, he knew he was going to make he knew he was going to die. But we got to figure that maybe his death might make life a little bit easier, more better for his friends and family back home. About an hour later, Kasuo died. It was not meant for a man to kill a man. It was meant for a man to love a man. But who am I but mortal's tool, no better than a monarch's fool, to play a part on earth assigned. No choice, no will, afraid, resigned. From Mortal's Tool by Spark Matsunaga in Italy, November 16th, 1943. Now, waiting to be evac'd out, someone else tripped over another landmine. This time, badly wounding Spocky in the right leg, but badly, but actually blinding another soldier. Well, Spocky officer, he's supposed to be evacuated at first, but no, no, no. He ordered the medics to take the blind guy out first. Well, sun went down before they could come back. So Spocky spent a whole night on Seal 600 by himself with his thoughts surrounded by the dead. We got evac off the hill the next day. A Spocky, he wrote poetry when he was a kid. He wrote even more when he was recovering in an army hospital in Italy. He told me that he was lost, that poetry saved him. I mean, not so much the words, but the feelings the words evoked inside him. I mean, his heart was numb and poetry brought his heart back to life. I mean, but capturing the hopelessness and the, the madness of war, poetry brought feelings of hope and sanity and made him feel human again. You will get well, you must get well. Her words, the pain of wounds dispel. And courage give to spirits crushed. Awaken designs for living hushed. From War Nurse, Lieutenant Ronan, 15 EVAC Hospital by Spark Matsunaga, November 20th, 1943. During a brief visit with Spocky in the hospital, he told me that he felt that he had done, hadn't done his full share uh, for the guys up in the front and that he should go back. He wanted to go back. And I told him, eh, more better be a live lieutenant than one dead captain, eh? Well, Sparky left Italy August 1944 and got shipped back to the States. Sparky was promoted to be captain in the spring of 1945 and was discharged honorably two days after Christmas. He was also awarded two Purple Hearts and the Bronze Star 
for exemplary conduct in the Rome Arnold campaign. January 30th, 1946, Spock legally changed his name to Spock Masayuki Matsunaga. Later on, he told me, with a name like Masayuki, he couldn't even be an elected dog catcher. <laughs> well, you know, the 100th Battalion became part of the 442 Regimental Combat Team in June 1944. The 442, that was the all Japanese American unit, one of the most highly decorated units in US military history. Well, I stayed with the 442 to the end of the war. And then I got shipped home. And I went back to university again. But hey, that's when I met my wife. And she wanted to go to law school on the East Coast. So packed everything up and we moved back to the mainland again. And I kind of got a job and kept us going while she went to school. Then she got a job in Washington, D.C. So we pack everything all up and move again. This time I got a job eventually as the, with the United States uh, uh, Capitol Police. I mean, I would hear from Sparky occasionally, but you no. Know, you know how it is when you get busy, eh? You know, it would be years before I saw my friend Sparky again. I mean, my wife and I decided to go start our family and between diapers and work, kind of hard to keep in touch. I mean, I heard that Sparky uh, joined the, went into politics, eh? and he uh, got elected to the Territorial House of Representatives. He, he even became majority leader. Finally, Hawaii became a state, 1959. Oh, that was a great day. And then, a cold January day, 1963, who should I see in the house chamber but, hey, old friend Sparky. <laughs> he had been elected to the United States House of Representatives, and his was the only Asian face in this whole sea of mostly white, mostly male faces. <laughs> That's about that time is when we began our evening chats. You know, I would stop by Sparky's office on my breaks, and if he wasn't busy, we see it, we drink tea, and we talk. Learn well the languages and the arts, for a genius unable to express himself is no better than a mute fool. Sparky Sparks, 1985. Now, in Congress, Spark was seen as kind of a dreamer or an idealist, eh, partially because of his love of poetry. He felt strongly that the Congress should create the post of Poet Laureate of the United States, arguing that Recognizing talented poets would be further proof of our enlightened commitment to the arts. <laughs> and he would submit a bill to create the position of U.S. Port Laureate every year for over 20 years until finally it was passed in 1985. <laughs> Persistent bugger, yeah? <laughs> now, a bill is not just a couple pieces of paper stapled together. No, no, no. It's more like about 50 pages, you know, because it's, it's a law. It tells you what the law means, where the money coming from, how it's going to be spent, how the whole thing's going to be managed, all kinds of stuff like that. And sometimes you get things called co-sponsors. That's either a representative or a senator saying, yeah, yeah, I believe in this bill and I'm going to vote for it. Yeah. A lot of work. Now, rather than just confront an issue in public, yeah, public prefers what the, Spocky preferred what the Japanese called nimawashi means uh, tending the garden or through preparation. He would go around to his colleagues behind the scenes and explain what he wanted and seek their support. And when he was ready, he unveiled his proposal in public and there's the support already lined up. Now, back in 1968, Spocky was an advocate for gun control, saying that more Americans had been killed with privately owned firearms since 1900 about 800,000 people that had been killed in all the wars America had fought since 1776. At that time, maybe 630,000. One day, I remember Sparky told me he was listening to this debate in the house and he looked up at the ceiling and he starts counting the stars in the great seal of the United States. They say, hey, only get 48 stars. 
It's supposed to be 50. So he goes to the speaker of the house and says, hey, add a couple more stars. And he asked that Hawaii star be the one added to the head of the eagle and not the tail. <laughs> After that, <laughs> he always told his colleagues from Alaska, you see the star by the head? That's Hawaii star. The other one, that's yours. <laughs> that, like other congressmen, Sparky received about 100 letters a day. First, he started answering them all personally. I mean, he would work in the night and then he'd go to a, to a political dinner or a diplomatic function and then return back to his office and he'd sip tea and answer letters to about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. He wouldn't go home until his inbox was empty. <laughs> After being elected to the U.S. Senate, the Washington Post called him the senator who never sleeps. Was a little bit hard on his kids. Oh, but Sunday dinner, Sunday dinner. Ho, 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 ho. That was very special. That was the most important meal in Sparky's household because that was the day he made sure he was going to be home for dinner. Sparky would say, Grace, and then toward the end of dinner, he makes sure he, he'd have like uh, either riddles or puzzle quizzes for his kids. Sometimes he'd quote Shakespeare or, or read a poem. That he'd memorize, well, and sometimes, and he'd often like uh, try out his new jokes on his family. For example, a psychiatrist examining a patient who asks, "Who is more satisfied, a man with a million dollars or a man with six children?" Ah, that's easy, man with six children. Why is that? Because huh. a man with a million dollars always wants some more. Never said it was good jokes. Anyway, Smokey continued to write poetry. And in 1970, he won a $10 prize from the uh, International Poetry Institution for his poem, Deja Vu. I've been here before, I say. That house, that wall, that brook. I've seen them all before, yet I've never been this way, nor read in any book of what I've seen. What strange things our minds must know? We know not yet our minds. When Japanese Prime Minister Yasushiro Nakasone was visiting Washington, D.C., he commented on the beautiful blooming cherry trees. And uh, Spock then recited one of his haiku poems that he'd written. Cherry blossoms bloom. Washington is beautiful. East and West do meet. Nakasone was so impressed, he asked for a copy of Spocky's haiku. Now, in 1978, 76, Spocky was elected to the United States Senate. Oh, he was over the moon. Because being a United States Senator, oh, that was a dream he'd had since junior high when he was in Mr. Clopton's class. When Mr. Clopton first put the bug inside his ear. <laughs> now, Ronald Reagan was elected president, and Sparky he reluctantly voted to confirm Alexander Haig as Secretary of State. Because he always thought, hey, Haig kept seeing, believed that there were easy military solutions to very complex matters of foreign policy. And he gave Haig some advice, quoting President Taft. War is not the continuation of foreign policy by other means. War signifies the failure of foreign policy. Now, short time later, Spock and his wife, they were invited to this uh, reception at the White House for visiting Japanese Prime Minister uh, Zenko Suzuki. And just before dinner was supposed to start, Spock and his wife were herded along with all the rest of the Japanese delegation into this one room. The only other American in the room was Secretary of State Alexander Haig. And the Secretary of State goes around and he shakes the hands of all the Japanese, introducing himself to the Prime Minister, to his advisors, and to, you know, all of his aides. And then he comes over to Spocky and says, Welcome to Washington, D.C. Uh, do you speak English? To which Spocky says, why, yes, I do, Mr. Pr Mr. Secretary. In fact, I had the honor of voting for your confirmation the other day. 
as the military flies over us in a helicopter. Hibiscus blossoms. Hawaii's native flower extends aloha. Undated haiku by Spark Matsunaga. Now, staying in touch with the voters back home. Oh, that was top priority for Spocky. See, Spocky couldn't go home every weekend. In Washington, he averaged about 30 visitors a week. And he'd talk to them and show them the tour of the Capitol. And usually took about the lunch. First in the House of Representatives dining room and then later in the Senate dining room. <laughs> he brought so much business to the Senate dining room that they eventually gave him a discount on their famous bean soup. <laughs> the tradition began when an elderly couple from Maui came to the Capitol for the first time in 1964. Now, a neighbor called Spock and said, hey, you know, uh, can you give him a few minutes of your time? Because the, these people had never left the islands before. So he treated them to lunch and gave them a brief tour of the capital. And they're shaking hands saying goodbye. And the old man, he say, yeah, Spocky, you know, I worked for Maui Pineapple for 40 years. For 40 years, I pay Uncle Sam's taxes. I don't get nothing back. I don't grumble. After today, Uncle Sam, pay me all back. Strike at your foe and be struck back in return. Befriend your foe and make your own peace. Sparky Sparks, 1985. Although Sparky was a soldier and a warrior, he was also relentless in his pursuit of peace. Now, the concept of an office of peace in the federal government, that goes way back to George Washington's time. See, Sparky pictured this, this center that did research on res, uh, conflict resolution and to provide education and training on techniques for resolving conflicts peacefully. The Peace Academy will not eliminate our need for a strong national defense, but by learning to cope with international disputes without resulting to violence, we will increase our national security and reduce our reliance on costly weapons. It will be a positive action toward ensuring world peace in the future by teaching future leaders of the world the art of peacemaking, the art of settling international disputes without resort to violence. Spocky introduced legislation to establish the Academy of Peace in every Congress since he, took, since he took office in 1963. He proposed the bill again in 1983, this time with 52 senators as co-sponsors. It passed the Senate. Now, the U.S. Peace Institute was signed into law in 1984, 21 years after he first introduced that first bill and 47 years after he wrote that essay for his freshman English class. Now, running for re-election for the Senate 1982, Spocky would jump on a plane on Thursday afternoon, fly to Hawaii, campaign Friday, campaign Saturday, and then fly back Sunday. <laughs> Suffering from jet lag, he once told this rally crowd, I go to bed shortly before midnight, but I'm up at 2.30 in the morning and I am wide awake. You cannot imagine how frustrating it is to be a politician in an election year and to be wide awake and not have anyone's hand to shake. <laughs> he believed that uh, representatives and senators only had two main duties. First, to serve the constituents uh, back home and to look after the interests of their state in Washington, D.C. And two, to work with uh, their colleagues from other states and with members from the opposing parties to resolve conflicts at the national level and to promote the national interest. Spocky was a major proponent for alternative energy, including geothermal and steam, and also solar energy. See, he wanted to drive the cost of energy down so everyone had enough energy. Unless we establish ourselves as an energy self-sufficient nation, 
we will never be able to fully and effectively control our own economic destiny. This imperative in turn requires us to exploit all of our renewable energy resources. 10 years before the Gulf War, Sparky, he predicted a major conflict would erupt in the Persian Gulf. Americans have already died in the Persian Gulf protecting the oil supply at a time when oil is relatively plentiful. Without alternative energy to oil, alternative, alternatives to oil, think of the international danger when the oil begins to run out. Most of his efforts fell upon deaf ears. Sparky was just a little bit ahead of his time. To seek out the wrong, that is only half the task. To set it right, that's the tougher half. Sparky Sparks, 1985. For me, Sparky's greatest achievement was obtaining redress and an apology for the Japanese Americans incarcerated during World War II. The Ishtis issue pushed all of Sparky's buttons. It touched upon his sense of equality, his vision for the country, his dislike for any kind of discrimination, and his sense of fair play. After the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, on December 7, 1941, in Hawaii, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which, under which, like over 110,000 people, Japanese people, two thirds of them, two, two, two thirds of whom were American citizens, were put in prison in these isolated camps, upheld for the duration of the war. Now, in 1982, a national commission investigated the incarceration of the Japanese Americans and concluded that Executive Order 9066 was not justified. The decision was shaped by racial prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Now, Spock introduced the bill. His proposed bill followed the recommendations of the commission and would have the U.S. government apologize all the Japanese Americans for the violation of their civil rights and pay each survivor $20,000. Spocky, the issue of redress went right to the heart of American democracy. What happened to the Japanese Americans in World War II could happen to any American. Redress is about setting the historic, the political, and the moral record straight and clearing the conscience of the nation. Sparky eventually lined up 76 of the 100 senators as co-sponsors of the bill, a veto-proof majority. Normally a bill would have maybe one, maybe five co-sponsors. President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act into law in 1988. Sparky was a workaholic, and I wish he, I wish he had taken more time to, uh, for himself and to really appreciate all that he accomplished. 1984, Sparky, well, he had a mild heart attack. Put him in the hospital for about 10 days and sent him, he put him in bed at home for about two weeks. <laughs> but despite the, the seriousness of, the, of these things that happened to him, now, Sparky, he always kept his sense of humor. Once, he joked about getting old. First, you forget names, and then faces. And after visits to the urinal, sometimes you forget to zip up your trousers. A little bit later on, during visits to the urinal, sometimes you forget to unzip your trousers. Hey, no laugh. We are getting there. 1988, Sparky realized something was really wrong. And he went to the hospital. He was in great pain. And he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Two years later, the cancer spread to his bones. 
and he was confined to a wheelchair. He struggled to get to the Senate for his votes, and his voice was so weak that he could barely speak. On April 3rd, 1990, Sparky returned to the U.S. Senate to cast his vote for the extension of the Clean Air Act. He was so weak, he couldn't speak. He had to signal his vote with a thumbs up. That was his last vote in the U.S. Senate. On April 15th, 1990, my friend, Spock Masayuki Matsunaga, passed away. It is better to be known as a, as a good man than a great one. For you see, greatness is an assessment of mortals, but goodness is a gift from God. Sparky Sparks, 1985. Sparky lay in state in the capital rotunda and then was transported back to Hawaii one last time, where he lay in state in the state capitol building. He was interned at Punch Bowl, the National Cemetery of the Pacific, beneath a simple marble marker. It said, Spark Masayuki. Matsunaka, United States Senator, October 8th, 1916 to April 15th, 1990. Beloved son of Hawaii. Spocky once told me, I want to be remembered as a friend of the peacemakers. I, I want to be remembered as a friend of the veterans. Uh, because if not for them, we would not be able to enjoy the fruits of democracy. I have found that the most successful public servants are those who continue to dream, who refuse to become cynical, and who have the courage to translate their dreams into reality. You know, it's been said that uh, war and peace are the same end, uh, ends of the same rainbow. Huh? Sparky, he tasted the bitter dregs of war. And he's always seeking a sweet and everlasting peace. He showed us the way. And now it's up to us to seek our own everlasting peace. Thank you very much. Now, I guess we'll open it up for questions and answers. Thank you so much for your just an amazing performance, Alton, today. Uh, I will just uh, go over to some of the questions from our audience today. Um, sure. Well, someone actually asked, uh, besides all the wonderful feedback and comments you've gotten, someone wanted to know, did you ever get to meet the senator? And if you did, what is your favorite memory of him? Uh, I did not meet Spark Matsunaga, I don't believe. Um, I, 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 I went to college. I began going to college in 1976, and I never really came back. I came back for one year in 1985, but uh, that was about it. Uh, and Spark, he lived uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, actually in, in, in Maryland, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I never really, and when he came back to campaign, campaign I, I was never in Hawaii when he came back to campaign, so I never really, really met him. Uh, I learned of him, like I said, when I began doing research for this piece. I mean, I, you know, people remembered him and they, you know, I've seen artifacts and, you know, I went to the University of Hawaii at Hamilton Library. I went to their rare, rare paper collection and I, he donated all of his personal papers there. So I went through his personal papers and that's where I just, I, I really got to know him through his personal papers as well as his, there's an amazing biography that was written. Uh, I don't remember that. It, it might've been called Spark Matsunaga Warrior Poet. Uh, 
It came out, oh, I guess maybe four or five years ago. It is an excellent book, excellent resource. I don't remember the author's name right now, but I'm sure you could Google it and find it. <laughs> no, thank you so much, actually. So uh, you actually went ahead and answered one of the other questions. What sources did oh. you use this piece? And so what I'm going to do is actually, uh, we actually have the book right here. Uh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> a Portrait of Senator Spark in Matsunaga by Richard Halloran. So um, this is the book you were talking about. And we actually have somebody in the audience from the archives as well. So uh, it's, it's great to see how everything's gone kind of full circle. Oh, no, I, I am very grateful for the people in the, in the, you know, Hamilton archive there. I mean, they were very helpful and, uh, you know, fulfilled all my requests and I was just so so grateful because I got some great insights into this man who I I, I never met but my goodness uh he was always the you know I guess they're the workhorse and the show horse right that's the way they kind of kind of de developed you know there was there was Daddy Noy who was always out in front and he was kind of the show horse and there was Spark Matsunaga who was the workhorse he was the guy always behind the scenes he was the guy sitting on the committee who determined which bills went to the floor so if you wanted your bill on the floor, you had to go through Spark. Um, and amazing things. And, you know, he's a very gentle man. I mean, very well respected on both parties because, yeah, he was a tough negotiator. He was a tough fighter. But he was, you know, when he was done, there was no blood on the floor. There's no bodies on the floor. That's, a, that's when people really respected him. You know, he fought for what he wanted. And, uh, but he was also very civil, you know. Uh, and uh, that was what he was known for. Um, impassioned speeches. I remember watching a video, an old C-SPAN, a videotape of him speaking about, trying to convince senators about this redress bill, talking about, you know, this, the incident where, where uh, one of the Japanese internees was shot and killed by a guard. And, you know, he's, he's relating to this. And it's just so emotional and so, so charged. Uh, but an amazing, eloquent speaker. Thank you so much. Another question uh, that came through was, is there a book of Senator Matsunaga's poetry? I don't know. Um, I personally am like not said, aware of that, so that's why. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, like I said, I, stum I, I knew that because uh, you know when when Mark Jeffers at uh, the Storybook Theater. I mean, in fact, they're having a celebration of Spark's birthday at the Storybook Theater in Hanafepe. There's a statue of Spark in the in the back garden, and they're having a whole big ceremony there. But when he first commissioned me for this work, because I really didn't, I knew of him, but I didn't really know a lot of Spark. Uh, he told me, you know, hey, they're, they're, he, he's a poet. I said, really? Okay. And it wasn't until I, I dove into his personal papers that I found, you know, handwritten notes, handwritten uh, back of the envelope poetry and things like that. And uh, a lot of it, I, think, I don't know if it's published or not, but like I said, I, I found copies of a lot of this stuff. And that was just eye-opening to me. Um, that's the reason why when I when I created this piece, I really wanted to incorporate a lot of those those bits of poetry that I I thought was so wonderful. Um, but I'm not aware of of a collection or of anything like that that was written or published. Yeah, no. Uh, the only other books that I have of the senators is uh, the Mars Project. Uh, I don't know if you got around to reading into this Journeys and Beyond the Cold War that he wrote. And then there's just uh, the more addresses delivered in Congress, which is just a large collection of his talks but um yeah i have not heard anything about poetry I, I wonder if there might be something maybe in the in the archives or something that may have been donated so that's something and, I, and just to let people know in the audience um the congressional papers uh, here at uh manoa uh, at hamilton library they're open to well right now because of the pandemic they're not obviously <laughs> easily accessible but uh, normally, it is possible, just like Alton went in there to do research, if anyone happens to be on island, you're welcome to coordinate a time to definitely do some research. And I do know that, uh, oh, and I did get a message. Yes, we do have copies of his poems in the archives. So there we go. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to share, there, there were just some other just wonderful messages from our audience. Someone shared how in 1965, uh, Senator Masanaga came to speak at the RAT Bradford High School cafeteria. He remained calm and dignified despite some of our wise crackers in the audience. We were young and gonna live forever. <laughs> <laughs> brought home calmness even as the Vietnam War was revving up. Yeah. Um, 
Sparkle, he was such an amazing man in that he wasn't, I, I didn't talk about the, the Mars project because I just didn't have time. Was, this is already like a 40 minute piece, but he was a major proponent of space and cooperation within, out, out, in, in outer space. Uh, that's when he wrote the Mars project was, he was, that was one of the things, one of the things that he was really pushing for was cooperation among all nations in the exploration of outer space. Um, I'm aware of that book. There's also another book called A Man of the Senate or a Man of the Congress or something like that. It's another biography. It's sitting on my shelf in my library at in my home near Portland. <laughs> and I, I don't have it with me right now, but I think I'm, I know one of my former teachers gave me a copy of that. Um, and it is, and, and again, um, those are uh, the other thing that I really found. I learned a lot about Spark was after he passed away, I went to the main library downtown and I got congressional record of all the, of what people were saying after he passed away. I mean, there's a whole volume of senator after senator just talking about their remembrances of him. It's on the congressional record. And I read through all of that. And it was, it was fascinating. It was amazing. He, again, very well respected uh, from both sides, from both parties. Yes. And uh, I just wanted to additional information about the congressional papers for our audience. Um, Don Su Oka, who happens to be the archivist there, uh, stated in non-COVID times, they are open to the public. And if anyone has questions, you can feel free to reach out to her uh, at sueoka, D at hawaii.edu. That's S-U-E-O-K-A-D at hawaii.edu. So I, I look forward to seeing what further research projects, who, who knows, there might be some other storytellers in our audience. <laughs> some other <laughs> studies of yours often. <laughs> oh, no. I it's fascinating. And like I said, it's, it's a very rich subject. And yeah, I invite people to go and like, you know, get his biography and just read about all the things that he was involved in uh, and all of his interests. Just sheer amazing. Thank you. And uh, we had a lot of people in the audience as well who have had the rare opportunity or the wonderful opportunity to have had lunch with him. And so oh. <laughs> uh, as, as you brought up conversations about the, you know, lunch in the Senate dining room, I just wanted to share with everybody a lot of, there's a lot of great articles about uh, the Senator doing that. A lot of the publications though do not mention what he would do at the end though. He would give everybody a gift and it would be the menu from the Senate dining room. And through the grapevine, we've been able to get a gift of that. Someone donated to the office. And so here we have a um, menu from 1986. He would sign it. And just oh my. It, it said to our good friend, Mike Jones, uh, Nikki Aloha. Spark Matsunaga, U.S. Senator. So just yeah, I mean, that's amazing. And he was so kind, and he brought so. I mean, there are stories that I that I, I remember reading uh, that he brought he, he brought so many people to the dining room for lunch that you know he'd have like multiple tables, and he bounced from table to table saying hello to people. And uh, he brought so much business to the Senate dining room that when he passed away, they named one of the tables after him. Uh, just out of respect because of all the things that he had done. Um, and, you know, that's a rare thing for the Senate dining room to even do. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was uh, one of his trademarks that he did. And he, you know, Senator is a very busy person. But, no, this is one of the things that he always, always did. Uh, definitely, you know, a man of the people. Yes, and to go along with that, I've heard that story over 20 times and. It honestly just feels like everyone just got together in a room and memorized the same story. And I think it just speaks to the consistency and the quality that he treated everybody equally. So uh, that just speaks to his character in itself. So um, a question that came in is what was on the menu that day? Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to go through the whole menu, but uh, definitely you have your gazpacho, you have bean soup. I think what's always the most shocking thing for people is the cost of things like coffee with 45 cents <laughs> so well it was back then eh? <laughs> yes, yes like like the tuition at uh 120 dollars you said right <laughs> back in 40. well that was in like 1937 too and that was for a whole year <laughs> <laughs> well if there are no other questions um oh we had some other comments uh, his desk at the senate floor had his name in kanji uh sparky carpet he had his own table in the Senate dining room in the floor arrangement. He had a bottle of shoyu. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Um, and then what else do we have? 
in the closet behind his desk, he had floor to ceiling macadamia nuts that he gave to guests. <laughs> that that's wonderful. I, I, oh, yeah. And in, in his personal papers, you know, there was I found a binder that um, you know, people would, would contact him saying, Okay, you know, I'm gonna be here, you know, well, how long are you gonna be here? What are you gonna be doing? How much time do you have? And he had different things, like if you're gonna be here for a couple of days, here's a tour you can take, and here's and if you're just here for a day, here's a list of activities you can do. I mean, there's things that he just, I, you know, give to people to say, hey, look, you know, this is what you can do. If you've got time, do these things here. Um, you know, a little, a little tour center is a, kind of amazing. I mean, you know, you think about how busy a senator is and the fact that he would, you know, when he first started out answering letters by hand, um, personally, staying in his office until the wee hours of the morning, um, that, I, that, absolute dedication um, and unbelievable. Uh, I know that he was also, he was also like a president of the, the 100th Battalion Club. And at that time he had lots of active members. So, you know, that was, that was no easy task. <laughs> so yeah, all these, yeah. these things that he would do. 1953, as I recall, according to his, his face on the wall <laughs> over at the 100th Infantry. So, okay. I, I want to tell you, uh, thank you, Alton, for just a wonderful performance for us today. Uh, you have an amazing talent, and we're truly honored to have been able to witness it live today, uh, especially in this era of physical distancing. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to hear the story of the late Senator Matsunaga and how he was able to thrive over so many obstacles of life, such as just in general. I mean, everyone goes through going to college, <laughs> adjusting to that, and listening to go to war. I mean, not only with the 100th Infantry Battalion, but then the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Then there, once more, we have racism in America or in the world and hatred in all of its forms. And still, he was able to overcome, continue to be a future thinker, such a forward thinker. I, I remember one of the conversations was about him looking into. Uh, was it clean energy back in the late 70s is a part oh, yeah, of yeah. what he was working on. So he was able to work also bipartisanly in our government to bridge the political divide, to bring our leaders together for causes, not only the Poet Laureate, but then the United States Institute of Peace, the Redress Bill of Japanese Americans, just to name a few. So thank you again for reminding us of his resiliency during those unprecedented times. Uh, a humble story that provides a spirit of hope and vision to overcome challenges in our own lives as peace builders. Uh, last but not least, thank you to all for joining us today's webinar. Uh, we deeply appreciate your interest and support in joining us to learn about these stories, as well as through our beginning end of the bomb talk story series.